the question that we are asking today is what is it like on the front lines? What is it like to the experiences that faculty have had with their students and faculty have had as practitioners? So we've invited four faculty today and I'm going to introduce them in mass and then each one of them is going to tell us a little bit about their experiences and then we'll have time for questions and really some discussion back and forth about what some of the strengths and capabilities have been, what some of the hazards have been, some of the hard lessons and some of the joys. So I think most of you know Dr. Kim Bradshaw, who's a clinical instructor and does most of her teaching with our undergraduates. Kim, thank you for joining us. Dr. Jessica Marsek is also well known to all of you, a clinical assistant professor who, again, does a lot of her teaching in the undergraduate arena, as does Dr. Valerie Marsh, clinical assistant professor, and we welcome you as well, and Dr. Laura Prochnow, who is, Prochnow, sorry, Laura, who is a clinical instructor and has absolutely, um, I'd say being been on the front line, some of her stories have been very engaging, even a little hair raising at times, but that, that is what goes with it. Ladies, thank you for joining us today. I very much appreciate it. We're gonna kind of go in the order of Kim, Jessica, Valerie, and then Laura. And again, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat and then I'll also pause us so there's time for people to really ask and to share their own experiences. Um, Kim, shall we, I think you're with us. I saw you yep. here. Um, shall we start with you? Sure, I'm gonna share this PowerPoint here that I just created to keep me on track here. So, um, navigating COVID with the students. It was definitely an interesting thing here. So, um, just a little bit as the Dean said, I'm Kim Bradshaw, clinical instructor, uh, school of nursing, OB specialty lead. I'm also um, a nurse on the birth center. So I work there on the weekends occasionally. Uh, husband and son are in the community, so I'm dealing with that. And like everybody else, I got a daughter who started online school for the first time. Um, a little bit about the unit. Majority of our OB junior students are over on the birth center. Uh, labor delivery postpartum, it's a 50 bed unit. We have four OR suites, triage, and about 240 nurses. So this gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. Um, Pre-COVID, they were always welcome. Um, the nurses liked to see them come. The students always said they felt they loved the unit, they loved the nurses. The nurses just, they teach them everything. They talk to them about everything, the good, the bad, the ugly about nursing, their careers. It's just the conversation was always fun and they enjoyed it. And then COVID came and things kind of changed. Um, so March, you guys all remember, COVID kind of started hitting and what we saw on the unit and um, with some fear and some concerns just in general. Um, we had, didn't know what was going on, what we, what our clinical instructors would hear was, why are the students still here? You know, why are you still bringing them? So around March sometime, you remember, we removed the students from the hospital and luckily we had some online opportunities where we could make up those clinical hours. So it wasn't too bad. Um, and then fall came and we were back on the unit. And, but at this time, you know, still working there during the summer, now we had COVID patients. And nurses were contracting COVID on the unit and more and more nurses were contracting it, whether by from the patient, which we weren't really sure, out in the community, which seemed to be majority of it, and from their home, somebody in their family had it, but it seemed to be almost running through the unit, it was gaps. And then we added the students to all of this. They came back and that's, you know, where we, we kind of saw the, you know, they welcomed them, but it was an added stress. It was an added um, pressure for them. The students weren't allowed in the COVID rooms. Um, they weren't, you know, the conversation that, nurses used to have with the students now changed. It was more about COVID. 
it was more that they they weren't nasty to the students at all but that conversation changed they were trying to figure out how the students how seriously the students took COVID. Um, were they taking precautions? What did you do this weekend? So I had to kind of have a conversation with the students. Of, if you are out there hanging out, you may not want to say that in clinical because this they were already um, pretty nervous. And then we had a couple shelter in place orders. And then the questions came again. Um, why are the students here? It's a shelter in place. So they didn't understand that students were still going to come to clinical, but yet when they're home, stay home. And it, so it kind of led to a, a stressful learning environment. Um, I just, you know, with, with working there, it was like my, my one thing, I just couldn't wait for clinical to be over because it was just stressful of trying to get them there and learn and have the nurses relaxed enough. Um, but we had a couple of situations where we had a couple of patients that said they didn't want a student nurse uh, because for fear of COVID, did they have it? Were they out partying? So we had to make some, you know, some adjustment changes and assignments. Um, the other thing, the one thing that I was really concerned about, um, it happened. We had um, a student who randomly got tested for COVID. She was with her um, mentor all that day. She was with me all that day, had a good time. The mentor just raved about her. And then we got a, I got an email the next morning that said her COVID test was positive. And the guilt the student felt was horrible. You know, she felt guilty. She felt... She exposed me, the mentor, the patient. She just felt guilty. And I felt guilty because I felt like I exposed this student to my coworkers. So I had to find the nurse, email. She wasn't working the next day. So I had to find her, let her know what happened. You know, we both ended up going to get tested. It was negative. Um, and she handled it well. The nurse wasn't upset, but she did say the next time she had a student, she, she was very hesitant about taking the student. She took her, but for the first time, she was hesitant about taking her only because of COVID, you know, but, and these were the things that we were dealing with. Um, currently now, now it's, we're back for winter. I can see a change. The nurses are a little more relaxed with the students. Um, and I think it's really because we have the vaccines now. Largely in part, they know the students are tested weekly. So I think that has um, presented a lot of relief for the nurses this time. Um, but they're, they're still welcoming. Um, they still talk about COVID. There's some different things going on on the unit, uh, but but it's 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 a little better. It's a little better. So we're just trying to again get through the semester and and have them learn and and in a less stressful environment. And so you know again not going into COVID rooms, but they're able to um, participate and learn and hopefully this we're still get just dealing with it. We're dealing with it and, and getting through it. And that's, that's just where we are. It just on autopilot. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Yep. Questions for Kim, because we'll come back into having some general discussion, but Tina, it looks like you had something you wanted to share about students with guilt. Do you want to speak to that? There she is. They want to show. They want to show my face. I'm freezing. Oh well, house. okay. But um, yeah, so I have a student that uh, we just started clinical, and she was there the first day, and then she's going to miss day, the next two clinicals, and she was just saying, "I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry." I said, "You know, mm -hmm. you can't control your roommate being positive. You're doing the safe thing. So just reinforce they're doing the safe thing." Mm -hmm. Great point, Kim. You have just such a deep understanding of the unit 
and your colleagues there. And I think we should remember that it's not just the students, it's all of you as faculty because you are nurses and you do understand what it's like to be on that front line. So I think that's a, a big, big communication tool and you may engender a lot more trust than you even give yourself credit for. So <laughs> any other questions for Kim before we move on? Well, think of as we go along. Jessica, are you with us? There you are. Hi, lady. Hello. Um, so my Wi-Fi is kind of coming in and out today. I don't know why. I thought the microchip in my vaccine was supposed to make the Wi-Fi better. It hasn't come through yet. But uh, if I'm cutting up too much, let me know, OK? Great. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing. I just have a couple short slides here. Showing up OK? All right. Um, so I have also been through COVID like all of you. It's an absolute nightmare, but we figured out some uh, ways to deal with it and we've gone along. So this is a, a basic screenshot of me as a practitioner. Um, so firstly, it, it's just myself and my husband, no children. Absolute cheers to Kim and anyone else who's trying to get their children through online school or regular school right now. I don't know how you're doing it, but hats off to you. Um, uh, most of my teaching is in undergrad with the seniors and sophomores. So I've gotten them through labs, through clinicals, through online classroom teaching. So I've kind of had my hand in all of those pots. And then I also practice on 6B at Michigan Medicine. And I'm going to kind of touch on all these bases. So my clinical practice um, full time before I took an appointment with the School of Nursing was on 6B. So this is my home unit has been for a number of years. And we're normally an internal medicine unit with a specialty in peritoneal dialysis. When we first were getting those spiked up COVID numbers, we became the designated general medicine COVID unit. So all of our rooms were retrofitted, the windows were blocked out, except for these little tiny vents for light so that they could all be neutral or negative pressure to try and keep um, everything within the room, and we turned all of our beds, including our shared rooms, into COVID rooms. And so we, we had kind of a, a double whammy. So it's a med surge unit. It's a lot of people's foot in the hospital, introduction job to nursing. A lot of people do their 12 to 18 months and they leave. And right around March and April was our 18-month point for a lot of our staff who were planning on leaving anyway. So we lost a lot of staff due to natural med surge attrition. And then we also had staff that had to leave because they couldn't, they couldn't be in that clinical environment. So a lot of our more experienced senior staff had their own health issues or family members they had to take care of. And so they were given temporary jobs on other units. And so we lost those staff as well. Um, and so I was trying to think of how to describe the experience of working on the unit during the height of COVID and essentially the one story that came to mind is the N95. So if you all have been working in the clinical setting or aware of our restrictions at the height of COVID, didn't have enough PPE, what we were doing was you got one N95 for the day and then you had to turn it in for reprocessing and then you would essentially use the same N95 for four or five days. And on my day four N95, I went to put it on and the strap broke and it snapped directly onto my earlobe. And that's basically what working on a COVID unit has felt like. It's like an insane trust exercise. It hurts you, but you just have to keep going with it. You have to keep your faith in it because it's the only thing you have that's going to protect you. And it's the same thing with your coworkers. Everyone's burnt out and ready to snap, but you don't have a choice except to trust in each other because you can't, you can't work in that environment in a silo and you can't work in that environment in a way that we normally did. We actually switched our entire staffing model to, um, to more of a team approach at the height of COVID. So instead of me with my four patients, it was you and another nurse or you and another aide and you would care for eight or nine patients jointly. And so we actually changed our entire staffing model to really rely on each other. So it was a really, really different, interesting experience. Um, 
but I have the, the very nice and unique position of teaching on the unit where I work in the unit where I've worked for years. And so I think that's really been a benefit for me. So I haven't gotten, um, I think the question that Dean Hearn was asked, do you get pushback? Do you get questions? And because I think I was a face that people knew, I'd already proven myself to them over the years. I'm not an outsider. I know this unit and I know how it works. Um, it has not been an issue. I really feel like the staff on my unit have stepped up. They have not treated the students any differently. They uh, are doing an absolutely bang up job of still working with them. Um, and so teaching on the unit, I think these are some quotes that I pulled from my fall teaching evaluations. And if anyone was teaching in the fall, I don't think this is going to look unfamiliar. And doing a qualitative analysis or a thematic analysis would be extremely easy because basically it boils down to these three things, which is we're concerned about how COVID has impacted our learning and our future as nurses. We're afraid to work with people in the School of Nursing, even though that's what we want to do. But the teachers have stepped up. They're really helping. They're here for questions. Um, they're trying to get me through this. And this is the, the one quote that really stuck with me. One of my students commented, she always answered our questions. She came to class prepared and she gave off a demeanor that everything was going to be just fine. And that's basically the attitude that I've been trying to project. I think our students are anxious enough. We all know that. Um, and so to project our own fears and anxieties onto the situation and onto our students is not helpful. And what I've found is that being honest, um, saying I don't know and I don't know, but reassuring them that we'll work it out, we'll figure it out and we'll get there when we get there has been fine for them. That's all they're really looking for. Um, so more personally and, and with teaching and clinical practice, I think a lot of it has come down to just the changes that I've had to make in order to either be more empathetic for my population, whether that's my patients or my students, or making sure that I'm compartmentalizing enough that I'm still taking care of myself. So that's been the real big balance. So if you aren't working clinically, one of the other things that's changed a lot are our visitation rules. So in the height of COVID, it was um, no visitors for anything, for any reason ever. Nobody got a visitor. Now we've relaxed a little bit, um, still no casual visitors. You can't just come because you want to, but you are allowed one caretaker if necessary. So if, for example, if you're a patient with a developmental delay, um, somewhere on the autism spectrum, someone can come and take care of you. And we are allowed to have visitors at end of life. And that's been one of the, one of the places where I've really had to examine my own practice and how I'm bringing that and projecting that into my practice and onto my patients and potentially onto my students. And so I think we've all had um, those experiences where you've had something happen in your personal life and all of a sudden you see it reflected in your practice. And it's, it's very hard to take care of those patients when you're thinking about someone at home. It's hard to not get yourself wrapped up in that and remain professional and able to do your job. And so on the left, um, that is my uncle Keith. He works in the Michigan prison system and he had COVID right in the height of everything. And that was when we weren't allowed to have visitors. Nobody got any visitors at all. So I couldn't, couldn't do anything to take care of him. And then in my clinical practice, this was at the point where we had iPads and we were doing Zoom calls with social work and we were holding up these iPads so that people could say goodbye to their loved ones. And it became... I think more difficult than usual to try and separate the work I was doing from my uncle, to try and separate what I'm doing here from what I'm thinking about personally. And you don't wanna, you don't wanna sever that connection entirely. You know, it's part of what makes us good as nurses. It's part of what makes us empathetic, but you also need to be able to perform. And so it's, I think that's been one of the hardest parts of working and teaching, but it's taught me to be empathetic for my students. They're having the same concerns. They're having the same fears. And because I know how difficult it is to balance those things, I think I can bring that into working with them. And so on the right, 
That is my sister-in-law, Cassidy, who was in her senior year when uh, COVID started. She was supposed to go to Michigan State. I know, I tried to talk her out of it. In the fall, couldn't go, they went entirely virtual. She just moved into her apartment three weeks ago and her roommate brought back COVID. And she is currently COVID positive right now. All mild symptoms, doing absolutely fine, but it's just, it's not something that ends. You know, I think we're all dealing with that and figuring out what that means for us and, and how we can take care of ourselves. So the last kind of thing I wanted to touch on is how I am trying to take care of myself if it's helpful for anyone else. So what I've learned about myself during quarantine is I am an extrovert. I am an extrovert's extrovert. I gain all of my energy from being around people, which I'm not allowed to do. So I have tried to learn introvert hobbies. Um, they have largely been a failure. I have tried to knit. I have tried to needlepoint. I've tried to macrame. I've tried puzzles. It's, it's not going well. Um, I think we've all tried Zoom as a replacement for social contact, which is mildly successful. I hit some really bad food habits in the summer. Uh, if you've ever had a box of macaroni and cheese for dinner, I think you can understand what I'm talking about there. I wouldn't recommend that pathway either. Um, but for me, it's, it's really been pets and keeping myself busy. I've essentially turned into a golden retriever. I need to be taken for one or two walks a day. I need to see my husband when he comes home from work. I get excited when I get the mail. You know, you kind of just latch onto the little things. And so to just end on a more positive note, these are the animals in my household that have been keeping me sane for the last year or so. Uh, so we've got one very anxious dog, one very angry cat, uh, one cat with absolutely no thoughts, and that is my husband, Brian, who was in full quarantine hair mode at that point. Um, and I'm very fortunate to really only have to worry about me and him. He's a, he works in patient psychiatry, so I essentially live with my psychiatrist, which makes my life very easy. Um, and that is essentially my experience. Jessica, thank you so much. There's just a ton of wisdom in that, just as there was for Kim. Um, I think we have one question here. Evo, I see it, but I'm not sure that I understand your question. I think it has to do with control of false positives in testing, because as all of you know, this is a PCR molecular technique, and so there's a good possibility for some false positives. But can you rephrase your question, uh, what it was that yeah. you wanted them to respond to? I was just wondering, uh, some of these tests, they have false positives between 5 and 35 percent. I mean, you know, what Kimberly brought up, you know, this can freak out the student and actually everybody around them. This could have an avalanche effect. So I just wonder, does the protocol involve, you know, if somebody comes and tests positive and they say, well, come back in two hours, we, we, we got we to gotta confirm that whether it's a real positive test or is it just a fluke? So, so uh, or, or are they kind of told, okay, go home, lockdown, two weeks, nothing. Is that how it works? I'm just trying to figure out the protocols, I guess. Um, before the, the group jumps in, Dana, do you want to share a little bit about how protocol is working for students when they test COVID positive? And then, um, Kim, Jessica, anybody else that wants to add some comments on this, it'd be great. Yeah, and I can't speak to directly what's happening over at Michigan Medicine. And um, Linda DiClemente, and I don't know if she's on this call or not, has um, been our point person, been fantastic, actually connects with every one of the students with a phone call when we hear about their COVID positive status. Um, typically what happens is we, we go by the guidelines that are set forth by OHS. Sometimes UHS will get in, or I'm sorry, we go by the guidelines by UHS. Sometimes OHS will get involved. There's some collaboration there, um, depending on the number of cases, et cetera. In the, uh, typically when somebody is deemed positive, they do, absolutely, it's time for isolation. It's usually a 10 day time frame for that. Anyone who has been in direct contact with that individual receives a 14-day quarantine sort of requirement. So we have contact tracers within the university system, some of which have been our nursing students, uh, thanks to Patty Tillman Meekins and um, the, the community faculty who have engaged with the students in the contact tracing component, where they're part of that role of contacting those that have been in direct contact. We did have a time frame, or there was a short period of time where they had uh, reduced 
the quarantine requirement from a direct contact to 10 days, but with the um, new variant, it, we see it's back up to really that 14 day requirement. And it is, um, doesn't matter if you've been vaccinated or not at this point, the guidelines are the same um, for all if you've had close contact. That's as it relates to the campus and the university um, guidelines in terms of academic, schooling, et cetera. If they are employees, um, they may have a little bit of different guidelines. Um, so for example, Michigan Medicine does allow, and please correct me for those if something's changed, but um, does allow those that have had close contact to continue their work or their employment as long as they are asymptomatic and they follow, you know, appropriate whatever that they need to do. Just, you know, if they become symptomatic, that's a different story. Um, but that's kind of where we stand a little bit now. Um, I don't know if somebody else can speak to the confirmatory. Jessica, you are nodding your head. Do you want to add into that? As an employee of Michigan Medicine, what's the mm -hmm. protocol that you deal with? Yeah, so Dana, as of right now, and it has changed a number of times, but as of right now, um, Dana is correct. As long as you are not positive yourself or you are asymptomatic, meaning you can still answer no to all the questions on the responsibly screening, you still go to work. Um, they don't, there's no exposure quarantine in place. Um, and then to touch back on Dr. Dinov's question about confirmatory testing for false positives, there was, there was a point in time where that was impossible simply because we didn't have enough tests. And so for a long time, we didn't even think about it because we knew it wasn't going to be an option. Um, right now, I'm still not seeing a lot of confirmatory testing. If we see a positive, we just go with it. And if we do test you again, it's when it's been long enough that you might test neg negative now, or we need to send you back to a nursing home or some other kind of facility who want to see a negative test before you arrive. So we're still not, we're not really seeing a lot of confirmatory testing now. If we get a false positive, we just roll with it. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting when uh, testing at home and what we call point of contact or point of care testing, um, probably when a couple months is really going to be much more available. So you may actually see a bit more of that because the limitation on testing will be different. Um, maybe no more questions, but many kudos to all of you. So do keep an eye on that, um, that chat. Val, are you here? Yes, there you are. You want to uh, talk with us about your experiences? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little different perspective. I'm going to talk about like a management perspective in the middle of COVID and how we had to put together an unofficial, um, what we call the PPE safety monitors, where I think Jessica, I believe, saw some of them. Um, they were staff that were operating room nurses and techs and MAs, and they were all put on um, leave because of the, the leave for COVID um, because the operating room shut down. So elective surgeries were canceled. All these people were, had two weeks of pay and were wondering what was gonna happen at the end of two weeks. And somebody in the hospital, I'm not quite sure who, decided that I would be the best person to train all these people that already knew sterile technique working in the operating room to go up to the units and monitor the staff so that they didn't contaminate themselves, that they would know where to get supplies, how to get supplies, how to use the peppers. And I actually, my job was education um, specialist supervisor for CVC Mott and UHOR. So I knew the place pretty well and just got a call one day and somebody said, where's our people? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they said, well, somebody said, you're in charge of all the people that are gonna come and watch us and make sure we stay safe. So about March 27th, I changed roles and all of a sudden I was a manager of this um, unofficial department. So being that most of the managers and leaders in the hospital were busy, I actually pulled in staff nurses that were union people to be my leaders. And one of the issues that I had was they were UMPNC members and so for them to correct or discipline their peers was not going to be okay. So everything fell back on me. I just gave them permission to just say it came from me and then I'll back you up later. Um, it was a very stressful time and I thought the best way that I could show my stress and the stress that the level that we were working under, I have a video clip. Um, this was 
probably about two and a half weeks into the process. It's about six minutes long. And, it, and what I finally started doing for my own mental health was recording at the end of the day how I felt. And in the mornings, it wasn't every morning, it was a couple times a week, but I would record my plan. What's my plan for the day? Before, instead of my mind going five million places on my way to work, because I had about a 20 minute drive, I decided if I would record it and talk in my phone, then, then I would, um, excuse me, that I would um, be able to plan my day out and walk into the department not feeling really stressed and frazzled, like what was I gonna do? So this is a video clip of um, April 7th. And, oh, sorry, oh my goodness. Anyway, let me find the video share. I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully you guys will be able to hear this. Let me know if you cannot. Good morning. It's April 7th. It's a Tuesday. Going back into work. It's about 6 12. A little bit hard to get out of bed today. Um, this is what's happened this week with my team. I now have a team of five Shelly Robbins, uh, Kevin Dombrowski. Michelle Churches, Annette Jacoby, and Jillian Bauer. And I may pull in this kid I just met yesterday named Nick, I think Darcy or something like that. He is a whiz kid at Excel. He's supposed to go be an observer for the PACU ante rooms, but I might just pull him onto the team as our AA since I can't seem to get one. I've asked multiple times and we really need help with their schedule. Um, we're deploying people now to 7D, 6D, B, C, and A, uh, C and W, 5, which has 17 COVID patients, RICU East, which has 40 patients right now, and they're opening RICU West, and I'm expected to staff that as well. Part of the problem is I was given a bunch of nurses from one of the directors. Well now HR has them on a deployment list so HR is pulling them away. So today I need to send a comprehensive list of everybody I have and ask them to take them off the deployment list so that um, my face is red I'm sitting at a light um, so that we don't have to continuously train people because we're losing some getting sick. Well they've not I think there's been five now looking down being sick. We sent them to occupational health. They've all been tested. I believe they've all been negative except for one went this week and we haven't heard back from her, but she lost her sense of smell, which is one of the signs of the COVID virus. So I'm not expecting her to be back. Um, they voiced to me they're scared, which I don't blame them. Um, so we're watching for moral distress as well. In the parking lot here. Um, so one of the things I did do with my team, I believe we're in the storming, norming, forming theory. So right now we are in the phase of forming slash performing. So in this phase, what I'm seeing is that people are stepping on each other so I had to sit down and actually have people um, take certain roles. So Michelle is in charge of staffing for the week like a charge nurse would be. Um, Kevin is in charge of the day-to-day -day staffing. Shelly is in charge of the evening staffing. Annette is staffing the PACU observation area. That's going to be a 24-7 started probably in about three to four days. Uh, it was delayed so they could open the RICU West first. So she'll be staffing that. She's going to need about 15.5 FTEs. I figured out the FTEs yesterday. So for the RICUs, they need about 8.3 FTEs to staff them 24-7. The ICUs, the, um, the units need about 6.5 FTEs. That was for the ICUs that were not all intubated. 
and then 4.5 for the units. I figured it by, because they're working um, 12 hour shifts, so they're not truly 1.0 FTE, they're a 0.9. So being 0.9 FDE, I figured it would fill in, and then I'm asking people to do eight-hour shifts to fill in the holes. So that's where we're at. I think we're finally at the norming stage. We're going to be training 10 more people today. We trained three yesterday. Next week, we'll probably train, I think we shoot for maybe next week to train more, but we need a total of 74.5 FTEs, and that's not even staffing some of the other units that are getting um, COVID patients. So we're finally being heard by HR and safety management. We have found a lot of mistakes. Safety management was teaching, take your brown N95 masks, which are in a brown bag and put them in your mask, your face shield mask plastic bag and store them, which is 100% wrong. They've been teaching it for a week. So I heard safety management person telling them in the PACU observation when I went in Sunday area and I said that's I don't think that's right but things change so fast you don't want to accuse anybody of anything you want to look it up and get the facts and circle back and make the correction so that's one of the things that we're kind of learning you know everybody's confused but I think we're finally at a point where as the observers safety monitors we finally understand the rationale behind what we're doing which is making a lot more sense okay starting my day hopefully i won't be here too long i have a video conference at four i'm hoping to be home for all right i'll check back good morning it's april 7th it's a tuesday Sorry. going back into work it's so That was my life for three months. Um, I think part of the point was that although it was mass confusion, it still worked and we still figured it out and we figured it out together. And I think they ended up testing over 3000 um, employees for COVID. And at the time that we were done, they only had 380 that tested positive. So I feel like that showed how important it was for us to watch the nurses down and off and let them know when they contaminated when they didn't some of the units we had to tell them you cannot have your drink on your contamination cart is not okay so we would go around and we would take them away but we had a daily email that everybody read with questions and then the um they had to check the infection control and the covid website every single day for changes and then we went on this kind of a group blog that we had or a group email saying what changes happened and what changes we needed to do and we were changing like sometimes things change twice a day but we got through it i met a lot of great people and a lot of people stepped up to the plate the people that helped me run my team had never been managers maybe charge nurses um one guy worked in the military a little bit and so these people that we also was i was also teaching them how to do staffing, how to do scheduling. like So it was very complex, but man, I sure had some competent people I met that were wonderful. So, so that was my story with COVID, just kind of a different, on the different side of it. Great Val, thank you so much. And you wanna take a look at the, uh, at the chat here because uh, you got a lot of rock star compliments coming in. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I think it, it, you're it was, right. Um, Sean's mentioning that handling tough times is inspirational. And that is something that I think we all need right now, that there's a lot of reasons to feel positive and to believe in the strength of people and to see the things that we accomplish. But thanks for the managerial perspective. I, I yeah. can particularly relate to that one myself. Yeah, no kidding. It was a good experience for me. I learned a lot. So I bet. Don't, don't want to do it again. Yeah, well, let's, <laughs> not with COVID. Let's, ho let's hope not. Right. So let Thank me switch over to Laura and your last but definitely not least. Take us on your journey, if you would, ma'am. No worries. And you know, want to know what's really funny about this whole thing is we met for maybe 15 minutes and, and said what we might talk about or whatever. But it's so interesting because even what I'm going to talk about is a totally different aspect than what everybody else has talked about. So I just, I think that's so amazing that we're able to share different things. 
Um, hopefully you should see my PowerPoint now. And Kim, you and I think alike. This is one of my favorite colors. So I like to be bright and shiny like this lime green color. And I noticed you had that on your PowerPoint. So anyway, I'm going to take a little bit different aspect about um, COVID-19. I want to tell you about some of the positive outcomes that I have seen come, it, come from it. And um, particularly, these are personal. Oops, I want this. There we go. Um, so particularly, these are personal, but I will be starting with my aspects. So been a nurse for quite a long time, like many of you. Um, mainly, I practice in emergency and cardiology. Um, and then I've also been teaching for many years also. Um, in the summer, because I'm nine months, is when I normally do most of my practicing piece of it. So by the time I went back to practicing the summer, um, things were, were a little more under control per se. So I'm gonna share with you a couple different aspects that I saw. Um, this is my family. And um, the only ones currently at home is my husband and I, and then my daughter, and I'm going to be sharing a few things about what she went through from her side of things. Um, she ended up having to move back home from college due to COVID um, last spring, just like many others. And then, of course, this is my baby, Cooper, who's a big Michigan fan, and then any of us here that teach, I think that this kind of says it all. We are all have a superpower when we teach. And I just want to say that this, I think, is very, very relevant to dealing with this situation as a nursing instructor. In fact, it was so much so, um, Karen Harden and I are the lead faculty this year for the juniors that we actually called our team of faculty that were working together as Team Awesome, and we got everybody one of these t-shirts because we wanted them to know how important they were, especially in this time. So anyway, I want to start with my experience with the students. As I said, I, I've been teaching nursing students for 14 years, and I've taught at a different university and also a different college. But what I can say, I was so, so amazed at the resilience I saw in our students due to this pandemic. And the things that I want to say, I, first of all, I just, I mean, I love the definition of resilience. And I just want to give you a couple examples of things that I saw with our students this fall coming in so that we're able to easily, easily adjust to a misfortune or change. I mean, COVID has been a huge change. And for our students, it, it's just been unbelievable. And here's a couple examples. I really thought that our students would be concerned about going into the clinical setting and taking care of or being on the units and knowing there might be COVID patients there. That's what I thought I was gonna be walking into. I had students on the medical short stay unit, which is an extension basically of the ER, patients that have to spend a little bit more time in, than the ER, but not necessarily long enough to go up to be admitted to a bed, they go to the medical short stay unit. And the thing that I noticed about these students, they were not worried about being exposed to COVID. They were not worried. In fact, I remember one student said to me, and I quoted it here, this is why I went into nursing. I want to help people no matter what's wrong with them. And where that struck home for me, and many of you out there that are nurses, you might remember this, that struck home to me because I entered into nursing when HIV and AIDS was starting. 
I entered into nursing when we didn't wear gloves. And now I was being told, if you're going to touch a patient, you're going to wear gloves. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And so to hear a student say that, it just it brought back all those feelings to me. And it just it regenerated me knowing, wow, that's right. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. So they weren't concerned about COVID and it being out there. I want to say the student's biggest concern was they were worried that if they weren't going to be in clinical, that they weren't going to get the experience they needed to become the nurse they needed. And that's what they needed more than anything was that reassurance to know it's okay. And I can't, I can't tell you how many times, how many texts, how many phone calls I took in the fall that I kept telling students, if you're feeling anything, if you are out this weekend, it, please stay home. We will find a way to make it your time up. And we did. I had some wonderful instructors that came in over Thanksgiving. I had a patient that drove, or patient, excuse me, a, a student that drove from New York to make up her clinical over Thanksgiving break because that's when an instructor came in. So the resilience that I saw in our students was just unbelievable. So I wanted to start with that. And now I'd like to start on a personal side of things. And if I could, if you could just do a raise the hand, if how many of you out there know much about the material management or supply chain management of a hospital? Just put, put the, your emotions, just put a little hand up, anybody. I just want to see how many people. So I got Val, I got a couple people. Just trying to get an idea of my audience and who I'm talking to. So here's what I can tell you is that, so not too many. And me also, when I was in my nursing role, I think maybe about a total of eight hands. So I definitely want to share that I from you because to you because it's much different than how it used to be now in supply chain management in the hospitals. So being a practicing nurse, um, like many nurses, I'll say any practitioner um, in a hospital, we're trying to do the best we can to give the best care we can for our patients. And the most irritating thing to us is when we don't have the supplies that we need to do the job that we need to do. And fortunately, for 30 years now of marriage, I've had the opportunity to see the other side of the supplies not being there. And that's the supply chain management. My husband is currently director of St. Joe's Ann Arbor, Chelsea and Howell hospitals in supply chain management, but he has always worked in that area. So him and I always kind of butted heads anyway, because he'd be like, this nurse just yelled at me because I didn't have this there and that. And, and I'd be like, because she's wanting to do what's best for her patient. And so we've really helped each other see the other side of things. But what has happened throughout this pandemic, reflecting on this with my husband, is something that I have never seen before with nursing and especially nursing with supply chain management is there there's a better understanding perception tolerance of each other's role and the reason for that like I said it used to be oh man they don't have it stocked they don't have it in what are we going to do and, and and I remember being there I remember feeling that to now Everybody understands the nurse at the bedside, the managers, the president of the hospital understood why we couldn't get supplies in. I remember my husband, if he said it once, he must have said it 300 times to people throughout this pandemic. If I could, I would go down and make you the equipment you need right now in my barn, but I can't because his hands were tied. And that was the other part of understanding roles and tolerance and perceptions 
is that his hands were tied not from just, oh yeah, we can't get the supplies. They were tied from a government level. And what I mean, I, I didn't know any of this went on. I mean, I don't know how many of us did. We, we haven't really had a pandemic before like this. Um, but in order for the hospitals to get the appropriate numbers of supplies, my husband had to supply what they normally would use in non-COVID times, which that was easy to do. You know, they keep all those numbers and track all that and everything. But the difficult thing for him was they wanted to know on a day-to-day -day basis and whatever he told the government because he ended up being on our statewide task force for supplies as representing the hospitals. Whatever he told the government they used on the day, they would see if they could get us those supplies. He had a very, very difficult time trying to get accurate numbers on a day-to-day -day basis, as you can imagine, when the poor nurses are, nurses, everybody, techs, pharmacists, everybody who is out there doing direct patient care, didn't know what they would be wearing from day to day. They didn't know if they would show up and be able to have a face mask. And so that kind of brings me to the Next positive thing that has really, really come out of COVID is, especially between supply chain management and clinical practitioners, is a common goal. And he said that this focus has changed. It used to be, and, and his whole career, he's always been patients come first, patients come first, just like we would. And they do think like that in ancillary areas. But he said the goal changed. He said our goal was not just to give good patient care now. He said that goal changed to now we have to keep our staff safe so they can take and give good patient care. And he said, everybody bought into that common goal is we need to be safe. At one point, he got a call in the middle of the night. We have somebody, it was one of the smaller hospitals, had run out of gowns. They had none. They couldn't find one anywhere in the hospital. So that staff went to, at the rural hospital in Howell, went to, in the ER, they went and bought some garbage bags and he got in the car, he drove to the other hospital, got what we needed to bring it in because our common goal what now is we need to be safe so we can deliver that care. So I just think that that was so powerful how the goal has changed in the hospital. We're still trying and we're still do delivering great patient care, but now we're really concerned about each other and those relationships and caring for each other. Which brings me to the last point I would like to bring up, a positive change of COVID that we've seen, especially between these two departments, is there has been a huge improvement in relationships between ancillary areas in the hospital and clinical practitioners. Because now they are meeting on a daily basis to talk about, to strategize, how can we meet our goals together to not only take care of our patient and give the best care we can, but how can we keep each other safe? And he said clinical practitioners, he could not believe at, as both Jessica said and Val, everybody has said so far, the standards changed on a daily basis. You can imagine it changed on a daily basis too when you don't have the right supplies in. Or you would get two million things from China and then your infection control nurse says there's no way in heck we're putting those on anybody because they're not going to protect anything. So then you've just bought all this supply that can't be used. So the improved relationship because everybody had a common goal. This brings me to, and I, once again, I just like to leave everybody with a positive note, kind of like Jessica did here. I feel many, many good things have happened during COVID. 
even though many horrible things have happened and we've lost loved ones, um, we've had exposure. I mean, just it, it's just horrible, the, the bad things that have happened. But what I try to do is when I'm thinking about, oh, man, this really stinks or this really stinks, I try to bring myself back to the positives. And this was definitely one of the positives. My husband's hair was so wild that I say to myself, at least I can go get a haircut now where how many months ago we couldn't. The one last thing I just want to mention, and I'm just going to show her because it was really hard, not only dealing with our students issues, but I got to tell you, I was hearing how our students were feeling from my daughter. She just completed in December, um, she was in school for occupational therapy age. She just completed that and passed her boards. But she was in a nursing home when all this was going on. And she would come home at night crying and upset. And once again, just like Jessica said, and um, um, the others, she wasn't worried about being exposed or she was so sad to see. She said, mom, you know, they had to do the occupational therapy at the bedside because people weren't allowed to go down to the rooms. They're not allowed to go to the dining halls. She said, mom, they would just take my hand and they'd say, please don't leave me. Please just stay a few more minutes. And here I have this 20, she's always been a very passionate girl, but she would come home at night crying, horribly upset. And I could only think about, gosh, what are our students feeling too? And then that just brought me back to, and I think it really helped her also of the resilience that it helped her and many others create. So that's all I got. Like I said, I just did a little bit different focus than everybody else, just because I live with that materials management side on a daily basis. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for sharing that for sure. You know, Laura told me that she might share this story and was it okay? And I said, well, first of all, it's got to be okay with your husband. I mean, I hope he knows that you showed that haircut. That's, that's, that's harsh. <laughs> he yeah. sent it to me. <laughs> oh, there you go. In any event, that's the whole point of sharing the stories from all different people that have had it. Thanks for that. This, you're right. From four different people, we've heard four different perspectives, but in every case, there's been enormous things that are positive and I think remind us about our common goals, why the heck we're really trying to get through this and get on with our lives. Um, let's pause for just a minute. Does anybody have any questions that they want to toss out to the group as a whole? Things about experiences or uh, things that you're wondering about? I wanted to just tell Laura that the supply chain was so important to the role that I had um, because we did run out of PPE and we ran out of N95 masks. Then all of a sudden we had to put together this entire way of reprocessing the masks, so getting them back to get them clean and then back up to the units and to make sure that nurses didn't get other people's masks. So I realized then how important that supply chain was as well as safety management because they were our go-to people to help us support the units. So his job is very important. So we heard from Kim, I think really a powerful story about the change of the dynamics of having students in a clinical unit and how we are reminded that those units host our students and they'd never have the education that they have but for being there and how complicated that was for someone who knew all these people so well and had to walk that bridge between the staff, the students, and at the end of the day, great education. And Jessica, I don't know, you shared so many wisdom things here. It was hard for me to pick out which ones to hit the most, but I really was impressed because you spoke about what you do to take care of yourself and how we have to do that. I have to share with everybody that I'm seeing pretty deep signs of stress everywhere in our school, um, staff, faculty, uh, students. Uh, I had a call from an alumna today who just went on and on and on um, with so many things that are tragic for her. 
that I think that taking care of yourself message really came through really strongly. And it's a tough thing to do. I think it's, it's just a real hard one. Val, I don't know, again, a lot of wisdom there, except it's we're all leading in a way and leading comes from all different shapes and sizes of doing things under circumstances that certainly aren't optimal. And I think that's another lesson that our students really need to learn is that sometimes we all do work under conditions that aren't optimal. I know actually when I got involved in research, that was one of the things that my mentor told me that if you're looking for the ideal conditions, you're in the wrong business, lady. And Laura, thank you for sharing us with that personal thing. And I particularly appreciate that you brought up something about the relationships and the common goals and how that's probably the glue that'll hold everybody together in the health system. And I'd like to say, I think that's the glue that's gonna hold the school together. Because all of us, staff, faculty who are nurses, faculty who hail from another discipline, we all have this sort of common goal of why we're here. And there are multiple missions, but it's that shared goal that really is the thing that we have to focus on. And I think will be the glue that will hold us together and we'll be stronger every year as we go forward. Any last questions or comments from anybody? If there is, now would be the time to hop in. I just want to shout out a couple of people who probably made my experience easier because you don't work in a silo on the unit and we don't, well, we're trying not to work in silos in the school too, as much as we can. Um, so, you know, teaching clinically, teaching in the classroom. I know Tina Leach took a lot of the responsibility for trying to figure out what the sophomores in my class were doing, um, you know, Penny, Dana and Ellie and Diane and um, everyone trying to make sure that we had clear expectations and rules and that we knew what we were doing and we could tell the units definitely yes or definitely no. This is what we can do and this is what we can't do. You know, all the behind the scenes work that went into things that sounded simple but were not simple that I didn't have to do because you all did that for us. So there's, there's definitely a lot of behind the scenes work that we should continue to shout out because it's still making our lives easier. Well said. Anybody else have anything they want to put out there before we break and go get our dinners, feed our animals, take care of our kids, think about tomorrow, our students and the work left to do for the day? Well, then let me thank our four panelists for sharing their experiences, really. Um, it's a remarkable thing that you accomplish and so, so well done to share those pieces. I think our next um, Zoom, we're gonna focus a bit on research because I think you may find it very interesting to find out how some of our people that are working in discovery and how their lives have been changed and how it has influences both on our students and on our school in general. So on that, let me thank everyone for being with us today. I think we're gonna walk away from this with a lot of thoughts and a lot of things to think about. And one of them will be, we're glad to be alive. On that note, have a good dinner. See you soon. <laughs>